and now we're reaching the end of the novel. The great auk has now migrated back to LD Island for the first time in two years, and this is where he was born. And he and the female that he was reunited with after the big hurricane have gone up to LD Island, and they produced something pretty magnificent. It was time for the female's, female great auk's egg to come out. And when it did, it was the largest on the entire island, and the most handsome. It was an incredibly strong-shelled egg. This was essential, for no easily breakable egg could have lasted on those bare rocks, where ever-probing wind delighted in rolling about and bumping them roughly into nearby rocky prominences. The egg was as big as a man's fist and, like the eggs of the muirs, tapered sharply almost to a point, so it would roll in a circle on the flat rock and not plunge off the edge into the water or onto jagged rocks below when the wind touched it. Unlike the soft green and brown speckled color of the thousands of muir eggs below them, the great ox egg was a rich creamy white with occasional spots of bright cinnamon brown with the scattering of deeper burnt umber splotches. Fate has seldom been more capricious than on that third day of June when, in the early dawn light, a sturdy three-master anchored in the hazardous waters a short distance from Eldy Island. A single boat was disgorged and it carried six men and three boys. It was a difficult and dangerous business to land on this island that had such a strong reputation for disaster among Icelandic mariners. It was chanced this time only because the vast bird populations of the other more accessible islands nearby had been so preyed upon by meat and feather hunters that now the only island with a profitable population of muirs and gulimots was Eldi. After several unsuccessful attempts to tie the boat to shore with the smashing swells, the men solved the problem by pulling it clear of the water on the very sloping rock used by the great ox. When the boat was secure, the men strode toward the crowds of nesting birds with shouldered clubs. It was a terrible, all-too-familiar picture unraveling before the eyes of the two great ox high above. Frightened, but not enough to leave their eggs, the smaller birds below watched the men approach them. Even had the muirs become severely alarmed, they could not have fled, for they were too close together to run, and they could not take to the air from level ground. As the men drew perilously near, the muirs bowed low, and then bobbed up and down rapidly, their breasts sometimes nearly touching the ground. From thousands of throats came a great thunder of, Err! 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 riding the whipping wind. Quickly now, the men pushed into the midst of the nesting muirs, and their blunt clubs began rising and falling. The three boys, not yet in their teens, who had disembarked with the men, ran back and forth among the dead birds, gathering the greenish eggs and occasionally throwing them at one another with gleeful laughs. When one of the men pa paused for a moment to remove his hat and wipe the sweat from his brow, he glanced from the muirs, and his eyes followed the promontory upward, only to widen in disbelief when he spied the huge forms of the two great ox staring down solemnly at him. Garefowl, he screamed. Garefowl, Garefowl! The other men stopped their grisly work and followed the line of his pointing finger, and their mouths opened in supply, surprise and pleasure. Here indeed was a fine bonus. Swiftly the, men, the six men spread out and climbed the promontory, advancing on the two great ox with their clubs ready. The two birds watched their approach with mounting apprehension. Finally, when the men were only twenty feet away, the great ox reached a command, and he and the female scrambled through the tightening ring as fast as they could, but they were on land now, and their movements were sluggish and awkward. As the female darted between the two of them and headed for the cliff edge, a bloody club streaked down in a vicious arc and crushed her skull. She was dead before her body stopped rolling. The great auk managed to elude the swings of the two men, and then was hit by a glancing blow from a third. He tumbled over, scrambled back to his feet, and continued that pitiful, wobbling run toward the cliff edge. The men converged in pursuit, and one of them, intent only upon the great auk's fleeing form, stepped on the single large egg, and crushed it into an obscene yellow stain on the, on the gray rock. Hardly a dozen feet separated the great auk from the edge now, but it was too far. A whistling blow from a club slammed into his neck and shoulders, shattering bones and stopping him permanently. The man picked up the great ox broken body by one wing and looked it over. The feral pleasure on his face abruptly dissolved, replaced by a deeply etched scowl. Arg, he growled to the others. Wouldn't you know that I, it would be my luck? Look at that big sore on his back, probably diseased. Nobody would want that meat now, and I couldn't sell the hide with that thing on it. Just my rotten luck. Carelessly, he tossed the great ox body away and it rolled to a stop near the edge, overlooking the expanse of the small island. 
The man who had killed the female slung her over by, over his shoulder by one leg, and the party trooped back down to the slaughter, to slaughter more of the nesting murres. Above them, body shattered and neck broken, the great ox's fierce brown eye retained a dimming spark of life. The carnage continued below him until thousands of birds that had been blanketing the island lay dead or had finally taken alarm and fled. The small boat made several trips to the larger ship with its grisly cargo. Every muir egg had been stolen or destroyed. Only the eggs of the dovekies and puffins, hidden in their clefts and crannies and burrows, had escaped unscathed. The pitiable voices of the surviving birds were raised in a chorus of grief as they flew around their tragic little island or paddled confusedly in the water a short distance away. At last the little boat and its crew were lifted into the mother ship, which soon disappeared around a shoal of distant islands, heading for their home port on Iceland's Cape Reykings. The great auk did not see them go. A film had formed over the once bright eye, and the bird's rapid heartbeat slowed. At last, with the cries of injured and anguished birds still ringing in his ears, he closed his eyes a final time and released a last wheezing breath. The great auk was dead.